Some actors never get to play an iconic role on television. My special guest today has brought three to life with his exceptional talent. As Tucker Jenkins, he remains a hero to a generation. As Mark Fowler, he gave for my money the greatest ever performance in EastEnders. And today we're celebrating his role as the Bill's ultimate bad guy. Ladies and gents, raise the roof for the legendary Todd Carty. Todd, welcome to the Bill podcast. Thank you so much, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's, it's an enormous pleasure. And I, I, I sincerely mean, I mean, you were always my favourite character in EastEnders. I, I, to this day, your performance is outstanding. And in 2003, you made what must have been a very brave decision for you as an actor to leave that series. You, you you got rewarded with a part in the bill, but take us back to what your thought process was at that time and how did the bill come along? Well, I'll tell you how the bill came along. I had a sabbatical in EastEnders in around about two, end of 2002, and um, all of a sudden I got a call from Paul Marquess, who was a new producer at the bill. So I think he wanted to bring in new characters, change things around like all producers do, but... So I went, basically, I had about six weeks off of me standards. He invited me down for a cup of tea. I remember going down to the ITV offices in Tottenham Court Road. Don't know whether it's still there or not, but it was then. And he started talking me through this character called Gabriel Kent. And he started to say, now, he's going to be, he's going to be a little bit dark, Todd. I went, right, OK. He said, nothing like you've played before, nothing like Mark Fowler, nothing particularly like Tucker, because I always played nice guys up until then. And... I was sort of licking my lips while I was drinking my tea. And he, <laughs> this character is going to be a little bit dark. And then I thought, a little bit dark? Heck. <laughs> my God. And for me as an actor, as a, as a, a young gentleman actor, to, to playing all these nice guys, cheeky chappies, to play an evil guy with darkness and intensity was, well, it was, it was like Christmas's birthdays, weddings all, all came at once. So it was, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. And so it sounds like they had a really good plan of what was to come right from the offset for you there was there was no easing i mean the, the character eased his way into the the kind of darkness that he'd reached but it sounds like they had it really planned from the off what you were going to do so, so did they sign you up for like a two-year period and, and i think it's normally a two-year period you know how these contracts work in this business they're a minefield obviously sometimes i think it's like a year with an option then a year i think they're all roughly the same all shall we say, the soaps and the TV cop dramas are all the same. So I remember the intensity that he was speaking to in that um, meeting that we had, that they had a big plan. And this was like over, I think they had it, must have had it over, I was there for two and a half, three years. And then obviously you see how a character goes, but I think they did have a bigger picture. How they based the character or what it was based on, I don't know. I hear rumours that it was based on a character from a from a let's say, a metropolitan police case event, which people aren't really allowed to talk about. You never know. Because it's a cop show, they obviously have liaisons with the uh, the police force to make sure that mm. they've got it all right. But there must have been something in it. I don't yeah. know what, but I was, I, was, I was very grateful for it. And it must have been quite an experience for you leaving one TV family and, and joining another who had been established for, you know, in some cases, the cast of a bill had been there longer than you'd been playing Mark Fowler. So what, what was that dynamic like for you from, from leaving one family and joining another? Oh, lovely. You've knocked it on the head. I left one BBC family, EastEnders family, along with Bill Treacher, Wendy Richards, Sue Tully. And um, you do build up a, a family. And I know people might find it quite corny, but uh, if you if you came on the set of Albert Square or Sun Hill, you'd realise the closeness that you, you build up because you live with each other more than you live with your real family, really, because you're there six <laughs> days a week, 12 hours a day. Yeah. So, um, and of course, the bill started way before EastEnders did, so I did go into another established family, but flip it out, the, the, my first scene was with Trudy Goodwin, who I must say is one of the most loveliest people I've ever worked with, and maybe, I'm not allowed to say this, I hope no one's listening, but she's one of my favourite actresses I've ever worked with too. Oh. Oh. So she... She held my hand, and um, we did that surprise episode where I think I attacked her outside. Um, yeah. I think it was a, a wedding reception, which was a bit of mysterious. They didn't say I was coming into the show then. And people like Graham Cole and, and, and Jeff Stewart, they all, they all held my hand and said, you all right? Everything's fine. Just, you're welcome. And then I just oh. t took a deep, sharp intake of breath and went, 
Ah, oh, yeah. they're looking after me. And you need that as a new... I haven't been in the business for a long time, but I needed that little help. And um, they certainly made me feel very welcome, particularly the wonderful Trudy Goodwin. She commented on you. I, I interviewed Trudy, and she uh, she said that not only a lovely guy and a wonderful actor, and so you, the, the feeling is mutual, uh, you'd ah, like to know. She's a sweetheart. She's a sweetheart. Oh, How lovely. How uh, lovely. Yeah, she is phenomenal and um i suppose you had a couple of old eastenders pals in the cast as well with roberta taylor and russell floyd <laughs> i did and we just we just looked at each other and we just laughed and said flip a dick where have we ended up you know so it, was, it was great to see old friends again and that sort of thing out as well lovely to see russell's lovely lovely friendly face and uh, R- roberta as well has been around for such an experienced actress. I was going to say for a long time. I hope she's not listening, but she, I think she knows what I mean. But she's got a very dry sense of humour. So that that helps. But with Trudy and Graham and and Jeff and Scott Maslam as well and Alex Walkinshaw, they all made me feel very welcome. But um, it was lovely to see the old... It was just We just had a little wry smile at each other. So here we are again. But we're in a different... We're in a different... We're in a different football stadium. That's what it was, really. Yeah. Well, well, take us back. Uh, can you describe to us a typical day in the life of making an episode of The Bill from your point of view? Who did you share a dressing room with? What time did you have to arrive? Take us back for a day in the life of The Bill. First of all, lots of people shared dressing rooms then. There was a, there was a few that might have been lucky enough to get um, dressing rooms, but that wasn't a big deal. For most of my time, I shared it with John Bowler. Was it Valentine he played? That's right, Roger Valentine, absolutely. Well, there you go. The old mind is still with me. That's good. I, I, I'll still have a future. So um, I, I love sharing with him. He was, he was a lovely lad, fantastic actor as well. But um, I lived in North London, and at that time, I mean, early in the days, I think it was made in Ladbroke Grove and North London, but then it moved to South London. South Wimbledon was the nearest tube. So it would either be driving there, getting up at five, being in at seven, getting dressed, going into makeup, and lots of the time you were on site where the police station was, where they nicked people, um, the hospital scenes, they were all on site. But the big deal was, I suppose, going out on the bus, all of us dressed as coppers, and uh, taking us to all different places in South London, East London, that, that kind of thing. So I think the difference was it was single camera compared to EastEnders and Grain Chill and well, Tucker's up with single camera. But I'd been used to multi-camera for about 12 years, and then we went into real estates and real life situations and real running down, running down the road, you know. So it was quite real. I mean, it's not any way as hard as being a, a real policeman, of course, but um, it was as real as it could be. So it was quite raw, almost guerrilla filmmaking, I would, I would call it. And uh, it was so real, but that would be your day. Come wind, rain, sun or whatever <laughs> the weather was, you know. <laughs> and I know some actors approach playing a bad guy as that they're not being the bad guys, everyone else who are the villains. What, what was your approach to actually bringing Gabriel to life? With Gabriel Kent, I knew, I knew the background. Um, I knew that he had a very close connection to, to Trudy's character, Ackland, because there was sort of like an adoption issue. He had a brother, and um, Gabriel Kent himself was uh, adopted. And there was a kind of a mistake, an accident that happened very long time ago that um, he found out who his real parents were then um, they ran out of the house to conjole either me or David Kent, there's another story, the brother, and they got killed. So I think within, in, in his soul, when you see Gabriel Kent come, come into it, he has a history, and he was vent on getting revenge. So that's how I always felt the character was. There was something weird about this guy. And when his brother came around later on, his, well, it wasn't his twin brother, then we realised the journey. He was bent on revenge on Trudy's character, on his brother, for the loss of his real parents, because he had a horrible childhood. And I suppose sometimes when you see people who go a bit wrong in their adulthood, sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's based on their childhood. So that's how I saw it, that this guy's got something going on inside him that even the viewers didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Until it was eventually revealed a few a few years later. Your your performance of madness of of this guy being deranged it, it, it it's so impressive. For a, a Joe Bloggs like me, can you in any way explain how you actually get there as an actor to to embody that person? I, you've talked about the reasoning, but how do you do it? How do you actually? bring this maniac for want of a better word to life yeah. and, and be so truthful because you know you all your performances are so real 
and and it's a huge testament. I, I, I sincerely am so excited to be talking to such a clever man. How do you do it? Well, thank you. Um, obviously, it's, it's the writing, and you get an idea of the storyline. So, and it's all um, very situational, if that's a proper word to say. So you get the script, you look at it, and you remember where you've come from, what you did last week, and and this journey. So I just sort of seeped into it. They they made it um, easier for me by the brilliance of, of the writing, I have to say. And everyone, I mean, each, I mean, there's not the same writer every week, but there's there's a fantastic storyline team and a, and a script editor. So they remind the writers again, I imagine that um, this is where he was last week and this is where we wanted to go this week. So in that sense, I picked up the script. But I, I, you sort of just get in. How do you say this as an actor, Flipper Mac? I think you just get into the zone of it. You get into the zone of it because they write it in such a way. We knew this guy was one hell of a weirdo and psychotic and he had big problems. And um, I, 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 I like the way he, he hid his um, his demons as well to the other people, you know, even with, you know, with the girlfriends he had, or with Kerry and with um, Bernie Nolan's character, and falling in love with his mother, stroke stepmother, uh, Atlan. I mean, it was, it was crazy, you know. But it was lovely to play. Flip and Eck, God Almighty, yeah. it was fantastic to play. Was it difficult for you at the end of the day after playing this guy to to switch off? I mean, I know some actors find it difficult when they've been playing such a either stressed character or a, someone who's who's been angry to everyone. What was your approach to coming back to being Todd Carty at the end of the day? Well, I think because of the, because I lived in North London at the time, and that was in South... It took me about two hours to get home. So uh, after I counted the 50th traffic light on, you know, <laughs> sh- shall we say, um, Streatham High Street, I'd also, I, everything went by then, do you know what I mean? So it took me two hours to get home. So it wasn't like I lived nearby and thing, but you, you just try and listen, you take your uniform off and you say goodbye to your mates and you see them the next day. But of course, the intensity, like doing a stage play or something like that, it does. So you've just got to, you've got to kick yourself and just say, right, you've got lines to learn for tomorrow. You know, it's like a well-oiled machine. So you just get ready for the next day. But um, yeah, what a time. Fantastic time down there. Brilliant time. Well, I'm interested, was there a difference in the public's reaction to you when you were playing Gabriel as opposed to how they perhaps might have treated you when you were playing Mark Fowler? Do do, do people confuse that line between fiction and reality? The thing about playing a villain is I think everybody loves to hate a villain. It's like in a a Western, in in shame, when the bad guy goes in, you really hate Jack the Lance, but you think, oh, flip the neck. You know, they normally dress in black in Westerns. But um, I think the only reaction was Mark and Tucker, I mean, obviously Tucker, you know, going back to everyone's school days and Mark being contemporary at the time. But there were a few times, I, I think I was in, where was I living at the time? Muswell Hill in North London. I'm not there anymore. But this, shall we say, an older lady came up to me and said, we don't like your type in this area. I thought, she can't be serious, can she, really? She'd obviously watched it the night before. And she was an old lady, so obviously I was being very polite. I said, what do you mean, madam? She said, we don't like your type in the area. I saw what you did last night. I thought, I've never met you before in my life. And then the... um, the uh, light bulb went going, ah, she's talking about what maybe I did to Kerry the night before. Yeah. So she said, listen, man, I've been living in this area for 20 years, you know, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a part, it's okay, I hope you're having a good day. She said, I don't care, get out of this area now. <laughs> and um, so I said, goodbye, madam, blah, blah, and just went off and went, oh, flipping, I <laughs> God, I might be really... And there would be... Th- there would be the odd thing from guys in white vans and Bill saying morning murderer, that, that kind of thing. So <laughs> it's a funny, funny thing about villains. Over here, we love, I think everyone loves to hate a villain. So um, I know he was a nasty son of a gun, but um, there's something about it that people found really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a weird one. I don't know how to put words to it, but um, that was a very strange time. And what are your memories of, of making the live episode in 2005? That must have got the butterflies going. Jesus Christ Almighty! <laughs> God Almighty! I'm glad you brought that up. Bloody hell! <laughs> it, it's madness. I did the first one. I had um, a very few lines. I, ju- I think I was looking and grunting and pulling faces. And the second one, I tried to kill my brother. Um, I would never want to do it again in my life. But after doing those two episodes, the f- it's like opening night, press night, doing doing theatre, but only 600 people 
in a the theatre see you this way. 12 million people, uh, people see you doing it. Yeah. Amazing, exhilarating, but God, I wouldn't want to do it again, but boy, the buzz after it. Mm. It's am- I mean, it's going back to the Zed Cars days, isn't it? And softly, yeah. softly, when they did it live. Um, I think maybe the executives get a real kick out of it, <laughs> seeing the actors running around like frightened rabbits, you know. <laughs> It's madness, but I'm glad I've done it, but I wouldn't want to do it again in a hurry. No, I, 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 and it must have given you a, a huge appreciation of the crew as well, you know, to actually make it happen. And you know, Well, you know, there's six guys, seven guys, eight guys on cameras having to listen to their cue from the director from the gallery or a, or, or a van, wherever they're doing, doing it from. But uh, the feeling of it after is wonderful, but the looks of the actors before they do it thinking... What have they bloody done to us? Flip it, Rick, what are we doing? But after it, it's exhilarating, but you, it's not something you'd want to do every day. No. You had your fair amount of stunts to perform as well. I mean, not least the Sun Hill explosion, the station yeah. blowing up. I mean, what was that like? And you're getting right in, in the thick of the action. You know, you can see that it's you hitting the deck and covered with flames all around you. What was that experience like? Well, it was, it was one of the biggest episodes ever, I think, because I think there was a um, running storyline with another psycho who wasn't a main character, but it was a semi-regular that we didn't know what he was up to. And it was it was with PC Dunbar, who I left die in the fire yeah. um, because she had far too much information on me. But the, I was reading at the time, it was a very busy time. All of a sudden I think, you know, the actor was lovely who we worked with. I thought, hang about, when I was watching his performance and had a look at the storyline Ah, I see what's going on here. So I, I wasn't the only psycho there. There was another <laughs> psycho who might even be more psycho because he blew, blew, blew the thing up. But it led to um, Gabriel Kent leaving Dunbar die in the fire. But, I mean, that was what we did it in. I think we went to Shepparton. We got quite posh. Get us. We went to, because, you know, we had to have all the special effects. And um, that was an amazing episode. A great oh, episode oh, yeah. to be in. Because it was so multi-layered as well, I think, Oliver. mm, mm. At the finale, I mean, were you aware, because when I spoke to Trudy, I mean, she, she had this quite conflicting thing for her as, as an actor because she'd been playing June for 20 years and then Paul Marquess introduced this element that she had, in fact, been a mother. And yeah. Tr- Trudy felt that she there were so many scenes she would have played differently over 20 years if, you know, with she played June as not being a mother. So... Were you aware of that kind of conflict? And, and she she talked about how supportive you were and how she really enjoyed working with you. Were you aware of that of that conflict? I'm just interested from the other side of the coin, you know. Well, what I was aware of in the very early days when it was called um, Wooden Tops, I think yeah. there was a, a pilot. Then there was um, a particular thing by the producers and writers that we would never, ever see the private lives of, say, Stamp. So then when Marcus came along, I think he decided, because he came from a very dramatic background, I think, didn't he? He did footballers' wives and things like yeah, that. Yeah. And what I heard, this is, this is only what I hear, is he wanted to change it to see uh, what the private lives were like. So you can't really blame Trudy for not knowing that, because it was only ever about nicking, chasing villains, getting mm. them back, chucking them in cells. So um, it was a huge thing, I suppose, for the regular cast and the original cast to to take on because it then became not only frontline Bobby on the beat, it became what goes on in their private lives. And I think the public took to that and they changed it to an hour long thing. And I think it was for the better. I think Paul Marquis did a, I would say that because it gave me the job, but um, (laughs) (laughs) he did a, he did a great job of bringing it right, right up there, right up there. But yeah, I can understand with Trudy, but Trudy is, you know, I keep talking about Trudy all day, but she's wonderful, wonderful to work with. And I, I think that relationship, I think, being very selfish worked very well. Oh, it certainly did. I mean, you guys had such chemistry, and and that, I mean, what a finale! You know, one of the all-time great exits for any character in the mm. Bills' rich history. That rooftop fight with Alex, and what was your reaction when you first read that script? You opened that page, and well, when I opened up that page, I mean, I'd spoken to one of the producers at the time because I sort of knew how it was going to. They had a, a few selected endings, but that was my favourite one. I remember being a huge fan, well, I still am, of, of Jimmy Cagney in the film White Heat. And the cops are closing in on him, like they did with uh, Gabriel Kent. And he thought, I'm not going to take this anymore. So he said, made it ma, top of the world. And I thought, if only I could ever get an ending like that. <laughs> and then I read it and I thought, no way, you're joking me. Is this really me? And, and so, so it was a great way. It was a great way to end the fight with Alex uh, on the rooftop and then 
all the coppers closing in and he's thinking, I think I've done what I've done in this life. Mm. And he turned to his right and there was Trudy Goodwin stroke mother stroke stepmother stroke girlfriend and he went, this is all your fault. And then he threw himself to his death. Yeah. I mean, what a way to go. Great. Uh, wonderful. Oh. Wonderful memories. <laughs> And were were you sad to be leaving the bill? Um, of course, I was always sad to leave Annie because you know I, I like to work and I enjoy working with actors and directors and writers and producers. So um, yeah, but I mean, I think with PC Kent, if he was still <laughs> God, <I'm okay. laughs> yeah. if he was still pounding the streets of Sun Hill, <laughs> a, a murdering, raping madman, then I think uh, I, I think he had to go. It's, it's not that we paint, painted ourselves into a corner. I think we painted ourselves into a high rise block for Christ's sake. <laughs> There's no way he could have stayed any longer. So I'm glad. I'm glad the way we said goodbye to him in that particular episode, which is I, I would say one of my favourites, even though I had to say goodbye. I just loved yeah. the way he decided to, the fatalism, saying, "Listen, what's the point? I don't want to do 30 years inside. I'm just gonna. I'm just. I've done my bit. Yeah. I've made yeah. my, my my point as, as a character, Gabriel. So no, what a way to go. I loved it. Every minute of it. And, and something that perhaps people might not know about you is that, you know, after you left the bill, you've also directed television as well as acting in television. And, and was that interest sort of peaking while you were doing the bill, uh, that interest to, to want to direct? And, and were you ever tempted to direct the bill after you left? I think the directing bit comes from when many, many, many moons ago when we had Super 8 cameras. Mm. And I used to make um, small little mini films with my family and my dogs and my sisters and all that kind of thing. So I got an opportunity. I was speaking to a producer who said, do you fancy directing um, a, a couple of episodes of Doctors, you know, the, the, the BBC um, afternoon program? I said, um, yeah, go on then. So uh, I turned up and I did, eventually I did nine or, or 12 episodes. So then I got the bug of it. Then I directed a, a feature film called The Perfect Burger, which is basically, um, well, it was a children's comedy horror and loosely based on Sweeney Todd. But instead of chucking the kids into pork pies, we chucked them into burgers instead. <laughs> so I had fun doing that, and I've, I direct short films with my, with, with my son and his friend. They're, they're young filmmakers. So I've got a film coming out called The Drive, actually. Oh, cool. It's basically about um, a reminiscence of a father and son. The, the dad isn't, too, the dad isn't too, too well, and they sort of come to terms with saying unfortunately in the end saying goodbye to each other and it's a, it's a bit, bit of a ghost film as well so uh my son tom and his friend adam who wrote it and directed it um they're entering it you know what uh, business is like now you just enter it into into film festivals mm -hmm. so it's called the drive and we'll see i've seen it i like it very much so um i do a bit of this and i, I do a bit of that you know ducking and diving as always <laughs> oh, <I love> it. <laughs> and what are you, what are your what are your hopes for the future? You know, what, are there still unfulfilled ambitions? Is is there another iconic role you'd love to play? You know, what's next for you, and what what are you still hoping to? Because you, uh, from what I get, you still love this business, don't you? I think it's because I've been doing it since I was four. I mean, there are lots of unfulfilled ambitions to do, of course. Continue making films with my my, my son, who's a filmmaker, as I just said, and his friend Adam Thomas Wright, who's also a very good actor. I think from the day that, um, and funnily enough, going back to the bill, really, because we filmed a lot of the stuff in Croydon Market and Croydon Shopping Centre, around about 1967. I'm giving my age away now. I think I was about four. Well, I might have been 44. Who knows? Plastic <laughs> surgery is a wonderful thing. <laughs> but uh, I remember doing a Woolworths advert, my first ever appearance on screen. I was four years old. And um, it was about, I suppose, eco economy and change and how good value the store was. And I remember the director saying, action, he gave me the lines, and I went up to her and I said the immortal words, here's your change, mummy. And mummy looked at me and said, wow, well done, son, meaning what a f wonderful place Woolworths is because of the, uh, of the good deals that you get there. So <laughs> I think from that day onwards, I always loved the business. And, um, and here I am now in the ripe old age of whatever my playing age is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Well, um, to, to sum up, I mean, we're so grateful for your time and very kindly doing this. So, so something that the, the Bill podcast fans and listeners, of which they are all over the world, it's, it, it continues to amaze and delight me. They, we like to support a charity of the interviewee's choice. Is there something that is something close to your heart that the listeners of this podcast can donate a couple of quid to and just to say thank you to you? Well, thank you for giving me your, your time too. I have a few charities, but just think of them. Now that we're talking about being a, a child actor, there's a few that I, I, I support, but um, there's a, a charity that's been going a long time and it's called Childline. And the reason I say it is because Graham Cole, lovely Graham Cole, was a, was a, was a, was a patron of the, the charity where kids can just ring up if they're having a bad time, not so good time, they need help. And um, I've always liked the idea that uh, sometimes kids might have might have a bit of a rough time at home or at school and they just need someone to talk to to get it off their chest and uh you know obviously help them you know help them get through through the day or whatever problems are having so yeah if there is a few quid out there thank you very much if you could put it as a child line that would be fantastic brilliant and and just to finish what is thinking back of the bill what is your memory and what is your message to fans of of pc gabriel kent of which I am one of them. I'm a fan of you. I think you're a terrific actor, and I, I can't wait to see what is next. I look forward to seeing the drive, and I, I look forward to seeing what's next for you. What is your message for, for fans of Gabriel and, indeed, of, of Todd Carty? Well, just at the time, uh, my memories of actually doing it and all the the, uh, the feedback that we got from it, from, from the public and the, shall we say, fan mails, emails, and that, that, that kind of thing, because I think it was... The bill was something set apart from the other, well, I hate to use the word soaps, but sort of a police soap, but it wasn't. It, was, it didn't ever start it out that way. But the way that the people reacted, and when we went to locations, and the way that they, 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 they greeted me after doing Tucker and, um, and uh, Mark in, in EastEnders, and how supportive, even though I was one hell of a bad guy, but uh, as I said, people seem to love to hate the, the, uh, the bad guys. So thanks for all the support, because it meant an awful lot to people. Had a fantastic fantastic following of course it's not with us anymore but um as they say you never can tell watch this space <laughs> todd carty what a legend thank you ever so much for doing that i'm really grateful really oliver grateful. it's been a it's been a pleasure sp- speaking to you it's been wonderful thank you very much and to um uh, and anyway now we can still see it on is it channel 20 yeah the drama channel it's still there. the drama Absolutely. channel I, I meant to say that it's I, I think i might be making my my uh my debut very soon in the next couple of weeks. So, uh, so we'll have a look at that. I know it's on a bit late at night, but anyway, we'll. Uh... Oh, absolutely! This this will uh, this will be going out while while Gabriel's just heating up nicely. So yeah, uh, the fans will be. This will be a lovely surprise for them. So thank you ever so much for doing it. I know it's going to make a lot of people happy. I like your term heating up nicely. You made my day. <laughs> <laughs> My huge thanks to the legendary Todd Carty for that wonderful interview. Such a nice man. We enjoyed a little chat afterwards as well. I'm really grateful to Todd for sharing his memories. It was a bank holiday Monday and my wife and I were driving back home after a nice day out in the sunshine. And I said, you know what, I'm going to try Todd Carty, see if he'd be up for a podcast. And within a few days, his agent had responded, yes. So goes to show, if you fancy writing to one of your heroes, just do it and you might be pleasantly surprised. So thank you, Todd, and your lovely agent, Stephen Gittins from AIM. Todd's nominated charity is Childline, a free, private and confidential service to help anyone under the age of 19. You can find out more and support Childline at childline.org.uk. We're sticking with the Uniform Branch next time on the Bill Podcast with an absolute legend from Sun Hill. Until then, take care of yourselves and keep watching the Bill. Bye for now.